Hello, and welcome to Orange Juice's Razer Onza Controller Review. I know, I know. I used to call it Onza 2, but the Razer Community Manager dude at GDC corrected me with Onza. Whatever. This video assumes that you already know the basic feature list that you can find on Razer's Onza product page. Ah, the thumbsticks what many would consider to be the Anza's main selling point. The sticks are definitely taller than the Microsoft's flagship controller, which gives it a longer radial path or arc length. Actually, I measured about 9.2 millimeters for the Anza versus Microsoft's 8 millimeters, which is 15% longer. The greater the distance you give each degree of rotation, the more precision you get. However, a longer lever arm might make it feel too loose, right? Well, that's where the extra resistance saves the day, and then some. So is a longer stick and extra resistance the unbeatable combo? Well, that's the idea. But could Razer pull it off? The answer is, well, uh, almost. Let's take a look. I used a spring force gauge in order to discover the approximate force in grams it takes to move the thumbstick from its neutral position to roughly the stick wall at various increments and tension settings on the Anza. I'll get to what I mean by roughly in a little bit. I must take the time now to give Razer props for going above and beyond with this dynamic resistance control idea though. At its lowest setting, it takes roughly 50 grams. At 10 notches up, it takes 60 grams. And that's actually the same as the Microsoft controller. At 15, 75 grams. 20 notches, 100 grams. Finally, at 25 notches, a mere 5 more clicks, it takes a whopping 175 grams. As you can see, the change in force increases with each click. This behavior can be loosely represented by this graph. As you can see, we have a bit of an exponential curve rather than a linear graph that you might expect. You know, this isn't really that big of a deal. However, if the x-axis instead of describing tension clicks described stick travel, then we might have a problem. And that's exactly what I want to talk about next. At the lowest setting, the stick moves smoothly at approximately one speed with a consistent 50 grams of force. This is very similar to what we see with the Microsoft controller, except the Microsoft controller requires maybe a bit more force and it's not quite as smooth. That's all well and good, but look what happens when we bump up the resistance on the Anza. This is at 15 clicks. Notice how the closer you get to the stick wall, the more force it takes to keep going at the same speed. In fact, it becomes exceedingly difficult comparatively to get the stick all the way to the wall, especially moving it left on the left stick for some reason. Even at lower settings, it takes hundreds of grams to make that final push. It's kind of like pushing in a sponge or a mattress, where it's easy to push in a little bit, but it gets progressively more difficult the more compressed it gets. This simile is the same as stretching out a rubber band or a spring. I became well aware of this phenomenon back when I used to do internal modification of Microsoft controllers to increase resistance in the sticks. The solution was to use a bigger sheet of silicone or spring or what have you and don't let the stick wall get anywhere near the stretch limit of the medium which is represented at the end of this exponential graph. Instead you'd be utilizing the more linear part again by being more conservative with the medium. If you didn't understand any of this graph and stretch limit stuff, don't worry, that's not really paramount to this review. The important thing to remember though is that unfortunately with the Anza, we're stuck with the sponge effect. Take it or leave it. How bad is it in practice though? In Halo, I was able to determine that max speed can be achieved slightly before the stick wall, but the exact spot is uncertain, especially when you're in the middle of a game. What you have to end up doing is aiming carefully and freely, but jamming the stick hard to ensure that you're turning at max speed. Oh, and I haven't detected what you guys referred to as slow turn, but I haven't conducted any conclusive tests on that subject. I didn't really anticipate the triggers being very different from the Microsoft controllers, but they certainly are. First off, they're oddly shaped, and the angle they are sloped doesn't feel very natural. Instead of being parallel with your fingers, they are some 30 to 40 degrees off, making it so that the side of your finger is the first contact point. As far as pressure is concerned, the spring is much looser. They require 75 grams to squeeze, while the Microsoft controller takes 175 grams. The squeeze distance on the onset triggers is notably longer, which would theoretically mean that you could be more accurate with the different degrees of pressure, making it better for racing games or maybe other things like that, but the springs being much looser and longer makes spamming the triggers much more sloppy. Let's talk about the D-pad. I really like the idea of making four separate distinct buttons for the D-pad because this should allow for less guesswork when it comes to diagonal directions. 
However, the D-pad is a little disappointing. As you may notice, the button travel is needlessly distant. In order to go from pressing only right to pressing only down and back, you have to very physically rock your thumb. In general, it will require you to hold your thumb at a higher angle to have more control and make fewer mistakes. For all those competitive fighting gamers who need to make quick and precise directional combinations, you may want to look somewhere else. I did get the Mr. Perfect Mega Man 10 achievement, which demands you beat the game without ever getting hit using this D-pad, so it really isn't completely useless. Oh, and to settle the silly debate, shot guard rescues do not screw up your perfect run. Some brief words on input lag. Using a relatively inexact methodology, I've rigged the camera to automatically take a shot after a set time of the guide button press. The results are fairly inconclusive, but I've posted the shots anyways. Last but not least, the buttons. The first thing you'll notice when you press one of the main four buttons is that it feels and sounds almost exactly like a mouse click, which I suppose shouldn't be all that surprising coming from Razer. I definitely like the crisp, clean click over the traditional spongy membrane feel you'd find on almost any other Xbox controller. The amount of force required to actuate one of these buttons is 70 grams on this Anza. On the Microsoft controller, I measured 121 grams. However, the shoulder buttons and the start and back buttons are a slightly different story. They are clacky and clanky and very loud, some being more so than others. This makes them feel like they may succumb to stickiness and inconsistencies over time. I am very sorry to report that my left bumper button has already, within the week of owning it, contracted what I like to call multi-click, which means that a single press may register as a double tap, a triple tap, or even ten at once. In Mega Man 10, that means that every so often I'll undesirably rapidly cycle through all my weapon powers, or in Halo Reach, I'll rapidly activate and deactivate my equipment loadout when I simply intend to just hold the button. The problem usually comes in waves. Once again, coming from Razer, this is not all that surprising. This kind of thing is infamous in the mouse market and something to watch out for. This brings us to the end of this review. There are a couple of things I didn't address. First, the remappable buttons. They work as expected, nothing much more to say. Aside from the fact that for some strange reason, and it's mentioned on the Razer site, the left analog stick button can only be mapped to the left shoulder button, and the right stick button to the right shoulder. The other thing I didn't mention is the overall feel of the controller. It's not drastically dissimilar to the Microsoft one, and everyone has different preferences, so I'm not about to get into a Duke versus Microcon debate. Oh, and yes, the buttons are glowy, and the skin is rubbery, whatever, that's neat. Anyways, despite all of the Anza's unfortunate shortcomings, its advantages are almost too hard to pass up. And so I see myself finally prying my claws off of Microsoft's baby as my main controller. Just looking at the feature list and the reasonable price, we can tell that Razer acknowledges what competitive gamers want. <clears throat> and they almost pulled it off. But that's good enough for now. Hopefully I've helped you come closer to determining whether or not to buy this bad boy. Thank you for watching!